I am Dr. Carrie Horn, and you are listening to an excerpt from my book, A Soul Aligned, How God Heals His Creations. Satan's Story. How you were fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you had said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, all of them, sleep in glory, everyone in his own house, but you are cast out of your grave like an abominable branch, like the garment of those who are slain, thrust through with the sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a corpse trodden underfoot. You will not be joined with them in burial, because you have destroyed your land and slain your people. The brood of evildoers shall never be named. Prepare slaughter for his children because of the iniquity of their fathers, lest they rise up and possess the land and fill the face of the world with cities. Isaiah 14, 12 through 21. If you are like me, you were taught a very elaborate lie in a church regarding Satan. The old story goes that Satan tried to rush God's throne and he was cast out of heaven with a third of God, God's angels who chose to follow Satan. I do not know from what Bible this story came, but it is not in God's Bible. And additions to the scroll have confused people regarding the nature of the war we face and what our responsibility is. We need to know the truth in order to stand in the truth and in order to know how we have been called to fight this battle. Let us look at what the word of God says about Satan so that we can truly understand the nature of what we've been facing and stand as God's people. In the word of God, the following is written. Satan was anointed as a guardian cherub over God's garden of East Eden, Ezekiel 28, 14. You were a seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Carnelian, chrysolite, and emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in all your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Ezekiel 28, 13 through 15. Wickedness was found in Satan when he tempted and deceived Eve to disobey God. And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Genesis three fourteen through 15 Christ said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raiding it. Matthew eleven twelve, Revelation 12 tells us exactly why the time of John the Baptist freaked Satan out. John the Baptist was announcing the coming Messiah and telling people to turn from wickedness to repentance to God. There are two requirements in order to triumph over Satan. One, the blood of the lamb and two, the word of the witnesses' testimonies who did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Revelation 12, 11. In God's law, two witnesses are required in order to convict, acquit, or prove. Deuteronomy 19, 15. Thus, we are a major threat to Satan, and we need to understand that clearly in order to understand why he attacks us. He hates God's people, and he fears God's people because we, with Christ, represent legal triumph over him in God's court of law. Moreover, the more we share our testimonies and the Holy Spirit also testifies to others, the more witnesses are brought in for Christ and against Satan. Jesus said that he saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning, Luke 10, 18. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1, 1, that is multiple heavens. The first heaven is that which we see on, here on earth and is visible, is the visible heaven in the sky. 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. Revelation 21.1. The second heaven seems to be where Satan and his angels work. This heaven is not specifically referred to as the second heaven in the Bible, but seems to be implied that this is what is referred to as the heavenly realms where satanic activity takes place. Additionally, if there is a first and third heaven, there's got to be a second. The third heaven seems, seems to be where God is and the heaven from which Jesus saw Satan fall like lightning. Paul said, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Second Corinthians 12 two. Thus, we know that there are at least three heavens that exist and Satan is in one of them. Satan is the God of this age and the prince of the air. We know that we are children of God, but the whole world is under the control of Satan. First John 5.19 the God of this age has blinded the minds of, of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, who is the image of God. Second Corinthians 4, 4. I've read many elaborate stories regarding the rank names and stratification of angels versus demons. The truth is scripture uses angels, devils, spirits, demons, and gods synonymously when referring to evil. They are all the same thing. Paul said that all angels are ministering spirits, Hebrews 1.14. The word says, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25.1. The passage reads, The devil and his angels, not the devil and his angels, demons, spirits, and so on. Satan's army consists of Satan and his angels, who are synonymous with demons, spirits, gods, and devils. Obviously, Angels and spirits can be good or bad, but demons, devils, and gods are all bad. Paul was speaking about good angels, but what he says about ministering is important. We can minister good, and we can also minister evil. A good angel will minister good, and a bad angel will minister bad. This should help you to understand the nature and purpose of angels and their communication with you. They minister to you according to the one they serve. For our purposes, I will use the word demons so as not to confuse the reader, but understand that all are used synonymously. Also understand that there's a difference between serving and submitting. Everything in all creation must submit to God, but these demons serve Satan. When scripture says that God sends these things, Isaiah 45, 7, and the Lord sent a spirit to torment Saul, 1 Samuel 16, 14, Understand that God does indeed send these things because they submit to him, but they serve Satan. The reason why God sends these things is because he hands us over to the one whom we have chosen when we keep choosing our flesh. There are some demons that are more wicked than others. Matthew 12, 45. Principalities are rulers, but there's no indication in scripture that they rule in rank over other demons as has been suggested but rather they rule over a territory such as, such as the principality that ruled over Persia in Daniel 10. Being that there's no indication in scripture that they have particular rank, we should not add to the scroll, but simply use the information that God has provided. The rank of demons would be inconsequential to us who are not attempting to ent entertain higher or lower ranking demons. Rather, we've been called not to entertain evil at all. And perhaps this is why God has given us only the information that we need, because God knows what we need. Moreover, God tells us that gods are nothing. 1 Corinthians 8, 5, Psalms, Psalm 96, 5. So I'm inclined to believe that rank really does not factor in at all to Satan's so-called kingdom. Everyone is just a pawn. Demons are given power when we give them power by choosing evil. Demons use their powers to influence corrupt systems and people. They have also been on the earth for a long time, so they have certain knowledge of past events. For example, a psychic who is possessed by a demon might be able to tell you things about your ancestors or your past because that demon was on the earth at that time. Demons can perform signs, Revelation 16, 14, and they can deceive and influence individuals and groups. Demons will even be responsible for gathering people to battle against Christ and his people in Armageddon. Revelation 16, 13. 
Demons are also associated with witch witchcraft, incantations, sorcery, idolatry, mediums, and divination. God has warned us that those who seek these things are made unclean. Leviticus 19.31 That is because they have defiled themselves by what is in their heart, infidelity to God. They are therefore subject to unclean demons, and God will set his face against them. Leviticus 26 No one knows from where demons came. There are many theories, but nothing confirmed by the Bible, so those theories cannot stand. We often believe that the end times are marked by blatantly obvious end time events. But Gabriel told Daniel that only the wise will understand and the wicked will not understand. Daniel 12.10 Thus we need to be understanding as God understands, not as our carnality imagines and postulates. To be sure, we've been told about certain events that must take place. But God told us that we were already in the last hour during his life. 1 John 2.18 He also told us that at that time, and from John's perspective during his life on earth, the Antichrist was already in the world. What did John mean by this? Let us return to Revelation 12 again. Satan was standing in front of a woman, Zion, the church, who was about to give birth to Christ. Satan stood waiting to devour Christ even before he was born. We see his plan in action from the time of Herod's decree to kill all children two years old and under once Christ had been born, Matthew 2.16. Thus, from the time of John the Baptist, heaven was subjected to violence and invaded by violent people. Satan was pretty upset that this prophet was baptizing people and telling them to prepare the way for Christ. We know that he was already in the world because when Christ asked him what he was doing after he was cast out of the assumedly third heaven where God resides, Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Job 1 7. Taken together, scripture seems to indicate that Satan goes between being on earth and in the heavenly realms. Ephesians 6 12. Possibly the second heaven. When John stated that the Antichrist spirit was already in the world, we have to understand that there had to be a Christ in order for there to be an Antichrist. This, this spirit, John understood, was already in the world during the time that John was alive. This is the spirit that infected people and systems in order to kill Christ and attempt to halt Christ's ministry. We see this from Herod's decree to eliminate Christ by killing all children two years old and under, and in his, his attempt to tempt Christ out of fulfilling his ministry and calling as the sacrificial lamb of God. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. While the devil was waiting for Christ to be born, he was angry and swept a third of the stars from the sky with his tail and flung them to the earth. We also see in Jude 1, 6 that God refers to angels which did not keep their, who did not keep their first estate, but left their own habitation, whom he has reserved for hell. We do not know when this happened, and there's no indication as to whether it was a third of God. It's God's angels who chose Satan. This passage in Revelation could feasibly mean that he flung his angels to earth, but it certainly does not indicate from that one passage or even both combined that he rushed God's throne, which by the way, God is spirit, so we don't even know what God's throne literally means. We need not add to the scroll. Isaiah also tells us of the end of Satan, when he is flung to the earth with the wicked. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You've been cast down to the earth, you who once load, laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high, but you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Those who, who see you stare at you. They ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the heavens and made the kingdoms tremble? The man who made the world a wilderness, who overthrew its, overthrew its cities and would not let his captives go home? All the kings of the nations lie in state each in his own tomb, but you are cast out of your tomb like a rejected branch. You are covered with the slain and with those pierced by the sword, those who descend from the sto to the stones of the pit, like a corpse trampled underfoot. You will not join them in burial, for you have destroyed your land and killed your people. Let the offspring of the wicked never be mentioned again. 
prepare a place to slaughter his children for the sins of their ancestors. They are not to rise to inherit the land and cover the earth with their cities. Isaiah 14, 12 through 21. Again, this passage refers to what was in Satan's heart and his doom at the time of the end. It does not refer to rushing God's throne or what he did when Jesus saw him fall like lightning from heaven. We know that there was an increase in wickedness and hardening of hearts prior to Christ coming to the earth, Romans eleven twenty five. So it's possible that the stars being thrown to the earth represents an increase in demonic activity that resulted from angels being thrown down to the earth. Nevertheless, we need to stick with what God has given us and not add our own story around it. Christ was born and then the woman, church, fled into the wilderness to be taken care of for 1260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled down and his angels with him. Revelation 12, 7 through 9. When the scripture says the word then, we know that it is offering us sequential timing. Sometimes the scriptures are simply telling us what is happening at the time or what will happen, but the word then tells us that something happened and then another thing happened. Let us look at what happened first and what happened then. First, Christ was born and the church witnesses were activated. We know that this is the witnesses because the only other place that we see 1260 days is regarding the two witnesses who are protected by God for this amount of time. Then war broke out in heaven. So war broke out in heaven after Christ was crucified and the witnesses began their ministry. We see reference to Michael and his angels going to war in Daniel 12 when Daniel was told, at that time, the great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Multiple multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. The saints and apostles were not confused about whether they would participate in the first resurrection. They knew two things. One, the end times had begun. And two, everyone from the beginning until the end would rise from the grave to either participate in or witness the first resurrection when Christ comes to gather his people to him. Now let's talk about the witnesses. The woman, Zion, or the church, fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1260 days, Revelation 12, 6. We know that two events have to happen in order to triumph over Satan, the blood of the lamb through Christ's sacrifice, and two witnesses must testify in order to convict Satan in God's court of law. We do not know the timing of the witnesses. One possibility is that the witnesses have already come, as Christ told the apostles that they would be his witnesses throughout Jerusalem and Judea. It is in this possibility that 1260 days could be a day to year prophecy in which the first part of the seven year prophecy has been fulfilled and we are well into the second half and Satan's reign. There are a few reasons why this is problematic. The most significant reason is that we know that the apostles were persecuted through their ministry, particularly Paul. However, the two witnesses spoken of in Revelation 11 are prohibited from being harmed until their time has come after the 1260 days. This is similar to how Jesus was protected until his time had come to be sacrificed, John 7, 6, and 34. Additionally, the two witnesses have powers to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with plagues as often as they want, Revelation eleven six. Thus, it's clear that there's a distinction between witnesses and the two witnesses spoken of in Revelation. Moreover, we were told by Christ that the gospel would be preached throughout the world for a witness to all nations, and then the end shall come, Matthew twenty four fourteen. Thus, it seems more likely that those who have witnessed to this point have taken part in sharing the gospel and building the church of true believers who prepare to prepare the two witnesses of the very end. In the chapter 
on the two witnesses. I will break down who the two witnesses are and why witnessing matters to our healing and and salvation, as well as understanding the times in which we are living. The two witnesses are Jew and Gentile believers, two bodies of believers who have been reconciled through Christ as one Israel. Thus, we can see that the fulfillment of two bodies of believers being reconciled is important to the concept of two witnesses, not two people, but the two reconcil- excuse me, but the reconciliation of his two churches as one fulfilled church in Christ. Why would God consider two churches instead of one fulfilled church? The reason for this is that the Jews were hardened in order for the full number of Gentiles to come in. In Ezekiel 37, God tells Ezekiel to join two sticks in his hand, one for Judah all of the, and all of the Israelites associated with him, and one for Joseph and all the Israelites associated with him. And he joins them together as one Israel as, as a prophecy that these two nations and bodies of believers will be joined together as one. This will fulfill God's church as one Israel. We can be sure that the scripture is speaking of, of the two witnesses who are taken care of for 1260 days. And this is not a day to year prophecy. The time is near, thank God. As such, we can also be sure that the dragon and his angels have not yet lost their place in heaven. The violence that heaven has been subjected to is still occurring right now, and it will not stop until Satan is finally triumphed over by the two witnesses who are required in God's court of law. Satan will be triumphed over when the witnesses testify and then lose their lives when he rises up in his 42-month reign. As it is written, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice you heavens and you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He's filled with fury because he knows his time is short. Revelation 12, 11. This is Satan's wrath. Heaven is thrilled, but the earth is going to experience some bad times. Remember that the Lord promises that those who faithfully endure and repent will be spared from the hour of testing that will come on the whole earth. Revelation 3, 10. By this time, everyone on the earth will have had an opportunity to hear the gospel and change, but they will not have chosen soon enough, and they will be handed into the hands of Satan, and they will experience the hour of testing that God will bring on the the whole earth. We know that there will be believers on the earth because we are told that when the fifth trumpet blows, after the two witnesses have been killed, it will not harm those with the seal of God. Revelation 9. Nevertheless, understand that when God says time is, this time is short, he's not just warning of the time until he comes. He's warning of our time. We do not know if we're going to make it through this day. We have no guarantee of how long we have to truly receive Christ's ministry and be purified, refined, and made spotless. And we must not take time for granted. Our time is always short. When John told us the spirit of the Antichrist, Satan is already here, 1 John 4, 3 and 2, 18, he was not referring to the passage of Revelation when Satan has already lost the battle in heaven. Revelation 12, 9 tells us the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. Thus, Satan will have already been leading the world astray when he's thrown down to the earth with with his angels or demons. Thus, the presence of Satan and demons in the world has been since the days when he deceived Eve and was thrown out of heaven into the heavenly realms and the earth. In the days when Satan is thrown out of the heavenly realms and his angels or demons with him, these will be the days of distress spoken of by the prophet Daniel in which Satan will reign on the earth for 42 months. Thus, because the presence of God's Christ had been established, the Antichrist presence had also been established. The word tells us that the sons of Issachar understood the times to know what Israel ought to do. 1 Chronicles 12.32 Likewise, we must understand the times in order to know what we have been called to do. This may sound daunting, but I want to encourage you that when you finally know your purpose in Christ, 
you're going to discover that his meaning and purpose in your life is the only thing that you have ever needed or truly wanted. Through all of the searching, distracting, collecting, treatment-seeking, relationships, and so on, Christ's purpose in you will overwhelm you with joy and fulfillment. There is nothing like the joy of the Lord when you truly know him and who you are in him. We have to understand the times in order to understand our purpose, the purpose for which we were set apart before we were born. Jeremiah 1.5 We have to understand our covenant with Christ in order to fulfill it. Christ had a cross and we have a cross and we are required to take up our cross daily if we are to be saved. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what is it? Pro- what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the son of man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Luke 9, 23 through 27. Salvation is a future event contingent on our obedience to the covenant that Christ extended to us. He took up his cross. Now we must take up ours daily. When war broke out in heaven during the time of John the Baptist, the two requirements for triumph had been set in motion. Only once this plan is fulfilled and Satan has been convicted, will the salvation and the power in the kingdom of God and the authority of his Messiah be fulfilled in our own lives. Now have come the salvation and the power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Revelation 12, 11. Thus, it's not until all of this is accomplished that the salvation and power in the kingdom of God and the authority of his Messiah come. Why? Because he has done his part and we have done ours. These things have to be fulfilled. This is obviously contrary to the story most of us were told in a church regarding fallen angels who were thrown out of heaven with Satan when he supposedly rushed God's throne. Satan's sin that got him thrown out of heaven was deception. That's why he's called the deceiver. They will lose their place in heaven when the two end time witnesses, Jew and Gentile believe, uh, witnesses that are required to convict, acquit, or prove have triumphed with the Lamb of God who gave his blood. Satan and demons exist for the agenda to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10:10. 10, 10. And now we know exactly why. We're required to we are required in order to testify and triumph over him. We have been told, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. 2 Kings 6:16. 6, the power of God alone is infinitely greater than any power of darkness. Thus, even when God's followers have been smaller in number than those of Satan, God always defeats the enemy. You, dear dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. God will always win. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Joshua 24, uh, 15, because our time is short. Many people refer to this end time talk as doomsday talk. But for those who are in Christ, there's no doom or gloom about it. The end times represent the fulfillment of our covenant with Christ and our eternal salvation. That is good news. When we were dead in sin, we may have thought that we were having fun and we desired more time for self. But as we look back, we realize that we were plagued by shame, fear, compulsion, insatiable longing and void. We were like a hamster on a wheel with nowhere to go and not enough time to fill our insatiable needs. Our needs were insatiable because we needed to know our purpose in order to be filled by him who purposed us. Nevertheless, it can feel quite daunting for those who know that they are still living for self and might be afraid of what God requires of them. We've all been there, and anyone who has crossed the bridge from spiritual death to life in Christ will tell you that God is gentle, merciful, and he knows exactly what you need and how to motivate you. All you need to do is open the door and ask him to work on your heart and bring you into his will. 
Just knock on the door and it will open. Ask him to help you and he will. He has promised not to turn anyone away who comes to him. John 6, 37. And if we return to him, he will return to us. Malachi 3, 7. If you have enjoyed this reading, please like, subscribe, and comment below. Don't forget to ring the bell icon for more videos like this. Thank you for listening and God bless.